chapters one and two of book one of on generation and corruption this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by geoffrey edwards on generation and corruption by aristotle translated by harold joachim chapter one our next task is to study coming to be and passing away we are to distinguish the causes and to state the definitions of these processes considered in general as changes predicable uniformly of all the things that come to be and pass away by nature further we are to study growth and alteration we must inquire what each of them is and whether alteration is to be identified with coming to be or whether to these different names there correspond two separate processes with distinct natures on this question indeed the early philosophers are divided some of them assert that the so-called unqualified coming to be is alteration while others maintain that alteration and coming to be are distinct for those who say that the universe is one something i e those who generate all things out of one thing are bound to assert that coming to be is alteration and that whatever comes to be in the proper sense of the term is being altered but those who make the matter of things more than one must distinguish coming to be from alteration to this latter class belong empedocles anaxagoras and leucippus and yet anaxagoras himself failed to understand his own utterance he says at all events that coming to be and passing away are the same as being altered yet in common with other thinkers he affirms that the elements are many thus empedocles holds that the corporeal elements are four while all the elements including those which initiate movement are six in number whereas anaxagoras agrees with leucippus and democritus that the elements are infinite anaxagoras posits as elements the homeomeries viz bone flesh marrow and everything else which is such that part and whole are the same in name and nature while democritus and leucippus say that there are indivisible bodies infinite both in number and in the varieties of their shapes of which everything else is composed the compounds differing one from another according to the shapes positions and groupings of their constituents for the views of the school of anaxagoras seem diametrically opposed to those of the followers of empedocles empedocles says that fire water air and earth are four elements and are thus simple rather than flesh bone and bodies which like these are homeomeries but the followers of anaxagoras regard the homeomeries as simple and elements whilst they affirm that earth fire water and air are composite for each of these is according to them a common seminary of all the homeomeries those then who construct all things out of a single element must maintain that coming to be and passing away are alteration for they must affirm that the underlying something always remains identical and one and change of such a substratum is what we call altering those on the other hand who make the ultimate kinds of things more than one must maintain that alteration is distinct from coming to be for coming to be and passing away result from the consilience and the dissolution of the many kinds that is why empedocles too uses language to this effect when he says quote, there is no coming to be of anything but only a mingling and a divorce of what has been mingled Close quote. thus it is clear one that to describe coming to be and passing away in these terms 
is in accordance with their fundamental assumption and too that they do in fact so describe them nevertheless they too must recognize alteration as a fact distinct from coming to be though it is impossible for them to do so consistently with what they say that we are right in this criticism is easy to perceive for alteration is a fact of observation while the substance of the thing remains unchanged we see it altering just as we see in it the changes of magnitude called growth and diminution nevertheless the statements of those who posit more original reals than one make alteration impossible for alteration as we assert takes place in respect to certain qualities and these qualities i mean e g hot cold white black dry moist soft hard and so forth are all of them differences characterizing the elements the actual words of empedocles may be quoted in illustration Quote, the sun everywhere bright to see and hot the rain everywhere dark and cold Close quote and he distinctively characterizes his remaining elements in a similar manner since therefore it is not possible for fire to become water or water to become earth neither will it be possible for anything white to become black or anything soft to become hard and the same argument applies to all the other qualities yet this is what alteration essentially is it follows as an obvious corollary that a single matter must always be assumed as underlying the contrary poles of any change whether change of place or growth and diminution or alteration further that the being of this matter and the being of alteration stand and fall together for if the change is alteration then the substratum is a single element i e all things which admit of change into one another have a single matter and conversely if the substratum of the changing things is one there is alteration empedocles indeed seems to contradict his own statements as well as the observed facts for he denies that any one of his elements comes to be out of any other insisting on the contrary that they are the things out of which everything else comes to be and yet having brought the entirety of existing things except strife together into one he maintains simultaneously with this denial that each thing once more comes to be out of the one hence it was clearly out of a one that this came to be water and that fire various portions of it being separated off by certain characteristic differences or qualities as indeed he calls the sun white and hot and the earth heavy and hard if therefore these characteristic differences be taken away for they can be taken away since they came to be it will clearly be inevitable for earth to come to be out of water and water out of earth and for each of the other elements to undergo a similar transformation not only then but also now if and because they change their qualities and to judge by what he says the qualities are such that they can be attached to things and can again be separated from them especially since strife and love are still fighting with one another for the mastery it was owing to this same conflict that the elements were generated from a one at the former period i say generated for presumably fire earth and water had no distinctive existence at all while merged in one there is another obscurity in the theory of empedocles are we to regard the one as his original real or is it the many i e fire and earth and the bodies coordinate with these for the one is an element in so far as it underlies the process as matter as that out of which earth and fire come to be through a change of qualities due to the motion on the other hand in so far as the one results from composition by a consilience of the many 
whereas they result from disintegration the many are more elementary than the one and prior to it in their nature chapter two we have therefore to discuss the whole subject of unqualified coming to be and passing away we have to inquire whether these changes do or do not occur and if they occur to explain the precise conditions of their occurrence we must also discuss the remaining forms of change viz growth and alteration for though no doubt plato investigated the conditions under which things come to be and pass away he confined his inquiry to these changes and he discussed not all coming to be but only that of the elements he asked no questions as to how flesh or bones or any of the other similar compound things come to be nor again did he examine the conditions under which alteration or growth are attributable to things a similar criticism applies to all our predecessors with the single exception of democritus not one of them penetrated below the surface or made a thorough examination of a single one of the problems democritus however does seem not only to have thought carefully about all the problems but also to be distinguished from the outset by his method for as we are saying none of the other philosophers made any definite statement about growth except such as any amateur might have made they said that things grow by the accession of like to like but they did not proceed to explain the manner of this accession nor did they give any account of combination and they neglected almost every single one of the remaining problems offering no explanation e g of action or passion how in physical actions one thing acts and the other undergoes action democritus and leucippus however postulate the figures and make alteration and coming to be result from them they explain coming to be and passing away by their dissociation and association but alteration by their grouping and position and since they thought that the truth lay in the appearance and the appearances are conflicting and infinitely many they made the figures infinite in number hence owing to the changes of the compound the same thing seems different and conflicting to different people it is transposed by a small additional ingredient and appears utterly other by the transposition of a single constituent for tragedy and comedy are both composed of the same letters since almost all our predecessors think one that coming to be is distinct from alteration and two that whereas things alter by change of their qualities it is by association and dissociation that they come to be and pass away we must concentrate our attention on these theses for they lead to many perplexing and well-grounded dilemmas if on the one hand coming to be is association many impossible consequences result and yet there are other arguments not easy to unravel which force the conclusion upon us that coming to be cannot possibly be anything else if on the other hand coming to be is not association either there is no such thing as coming to be at all or it is alteration or else we must endeavour to unravel this dilemma too and a stubborn one we shall find it the fundamental question in dealing with all these difficulties is this do things come to be and alter and grow and undergo the contrary changes because the primary reals are indivisible magnitudes or is no magnitude indivisible for the answer we give to this question makes the greatest difference and again if the primary reals are indivisible magnitudes are these bodies as democritus and leucippus maintain or are they planes as is asserted in the timaeus to resolve bodies into planes and no further this as we have also remarked elsewhere is in itself a paradox hence there is more to be said for the view that there are indivisible bodies 
yet even these involve much of paradox still as we have said it is possible to construct alteration and coming to be with them if one transposes the same by turning and intercontact and by the varieties of the figures as democritus does his denial of the reality of colour is a corollary from this position for according to him things get coloured by turning of the figures but the possibility of such a construction no longer exists for those who divide bodies into planes for nothing except solids results from putting planes together they do not even attempt to generate any quality from them lack of experience diminishes our power of taking a comprehensive view of the admitted facts hence those who dwell in intimate association with nature and its phenomena grow more and more able to formulate as the foundations of their theories principles such as to admit of a wide and coherent development while those whom devotion to abstract discussions has rendered unobservant of the facts are too ready to dogmatize on the basis of a few observations the rival treatments of the subject now before us will serve to illustrate how great is the difference between a scientific and a dialectical method of inquiry for whereas the platonists argue that there must be atomic magnitudes because otherwise the triangle will be more than one democritus would appear to have been convinced by arguments appropriate to the subject i e drawn from the science of nature our meaning will become clear as we proceed for to suppose that a body i e a magnitude is divisible through and through and that this division is possible involves a difficulty what will there be in the body which escapes the division if it is divisible through and through and if this division is possible then it might be at one and the same moment divided through and through even though the dividings had not been effected simultaneously and the actual occurrence of this result would involve no impossibility hence the same principle will apply whenever a body is by nature divisible through and through whether by bisection or generally by any method whatever nothing impossible will have resulted if it has actually been divided not even if it has been divided into innumerable parts themselves divided innumerable times nothing impossible will have resulted though perhaps nobody in fact could so divide it since therefore the body is divisible through and through let it have been divided what then will remain a magnitude no that is impossible since then there will be something not divided whereas ex hypothesi the body was divisible through and through but if it be admitted that neither a body nor a magnitude will remain and yet division is to take place the constituents of the body will either be points i e without magnitude or absolutely nothing if its constituents are nothings then it might both come to be out of nothings and exist as a composite of nothings and thus presumably the whole body will be nothing but an appearance but if it consists of points a similar absurdity will result it will not possess any magnitude for when the points were in contact and coincided to form a single magnitude they did not make the whole any bigger since when the body was divided into two or more parts the whole was not a bit smaller or bigger than it was before the division hence even if all the points be put together they will not make any magnitude but suppose that as the body is being divided a minute section a piece of sawdust as it were is extracted and that in this sense a body comes away from the magnitude evading the division even then the same argument applies for in what sense is that section divisible but if what came away was not a body but a separable form or quality and if the magnitude is points or contacts thus qualified it is paradoxical that a magnitude should consist of elements which are not magnitudes moreover where will the points be 
and are they motionless or moving and every contact is always a contact of two somethings i e there is always something besides the contact or the division or the point these then are the difficulties resulting from the supposition that any and every body whatever its size is divisible through and through there is besides this further consideration if having divided a piece of wood or anything else i put it together it is again equal to what it was and is one clearly this is so whatever the point at which i cut the wood the wood therefore has been divided potentially through and through what then is there in the wood besides the division for even if we suppose there is some quality yet how is the wood dissolved into such constituents and how does it come to be out of them or how are such constituents separated so as to exist apart from one another since therefore it is impossible for magnitudes to consist of contacts or points there must be indivisible bodies and magnitudes yet if we do postulate the latter we are confronted with equally impossible consequences which we have examined in other works but we must try to disentangle these perplexities and must therefore formulate the whole problem over again on the one hand then it is in no way paradoxical that every perceptible body should be indivisible as well as divisible at any and every point for the second predicate will attach to it potentially but the first actually on the other hand it would seem to be impossible for a body to be even potentially divisible at all points simultaneously for if it were possible then it might actually occur with the result not that the body would simultaneously be actually both indivisible and divided but that it would be simultaneously divided at any and every point consequently nothing will remain and the body will have passed away into what is incorporeal and so it might come to be again either out of points or absolutely out of nothing and how is that possible but now it is obvious that a body is in fact divided into separable magnitudes which are smaller at each division into magnitudes which fall apart from one another and are actually separated hence it is urged the process of dividing a body part by part is not a breaking up which could continue ad infinitum nor can a body be simultaneously divided at every point for that is not possible but there is a limit beyond which the breaking up cannot proceed the necessary consequence especially if coming to be and passing away are to take place by association and dissociation respectively is that a body must contain atomic magnitudes which are invisible such is the argument which is believed to establish the necessity of atomic magnitudes we must now show that it conceals a faulty inference and exactly where it conceals it for since point is not immediately next to point magnitudes are divisible through and through in one sense and yet not in another when however it is admitted that a magnitude is divisible through and through it is thought there is a point not only anywhere but also everywhere in it hence it is supposed to follow from the admission that the magnitude must be divided away into nothing for it is supposed there is a point everywhere within it so that it consists either of contacts or of points but it is only in one sense that the magnitude is divisible through and through viz in so far as there is one point anywhere within it and all its points are everywhere within it if you take them singly one by one but there are not more points than one anywhere within it for the points are not consecutive hence it is not simultaneously divisible through and through for if it were then if it be divisible at its centre it will be divisible also at a point immediately next to its centre but it is not so divisible for position is not immediately next to position nor point to point in other words division is not immediately next to division nor composition to composition 
hence there are both association and dissociation though neither a into and out of atomic magnitudes for that involves many impossibilities nor b so that division takes place through and through for this would have resulted only if point had been immediately next to point but dissociation takes place into small i e relatively small parts and association takes place out of relatively small parts it is wrong however to suppose as some assert that coming to be and passing away in the unqualified and complete sense are distinctively defined by association and dissociation while the change that takes place in what is continuous is alteration on the contrary this is where the whole error lies for unqualified coming to be and passing away are not affected by association and dissociation they take place when a thing changes from this to that as a whole but the philosophers we are criticizing suppose that all such change is alteration whereas in fact there is a difference for in that which underlies the change there is a factor corresponding to the definition and there is a material factor when then the change is in these constitutive factors there will be coming to be or passing away but when it is in the thing's qualities i e a change of the thing per accidents there will be alteration dissociation and association affect the thing's susceptibility to passing away for if water has first been dissociated into smallish drops air comes to be out of it more quickly while if drops of water have first been associated air comes to be more slowly our doctrine will become clearer in the sequel meantime so much may be taken as established viz that coming to be cannot be association at least not the kind of association some philosophers assert it to be end of chapter two of book one Recording in memory of Mitchell Edwards. Chapters 3 and 4 of Book 1 of On Generation and Corruption by Aristotle. Translated by Harold Joachim. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Geoffrey Edwards chapter three now that we have established the preceding distinctions we must first consider whether there is anything which comes to be and passes away in the unqualified sense or whether nothing comes to be in this strict sense but everything always comes to be something and out of something i mean e g comes to be healthy out of being ill and ill out of being healthy comes to be small out of being big and big out of being small and so on in every other instance for if there is to be coming to be without qualification something must without qualification come to be out of not being so that it would be true to say that not being is an attribute of some things for qualified coming to be is a process out of qualified not being e g out of not white or not beautiful but unqualified coming to be is a process out of unqualified not being now unqualified means either one the primary predication within each category or two the universal i e the all-comprehensive predication hence if unqualified not being means the negation of being in the sense of the primary term of the category in question we shall have in unqualified coming to be a coming to be of a substance out of non-substance but that which is not a substance or a this clearly cannot possess predicates drawn from any of the other categories either e g 
we cannot attribute to it any quality quantity or position otherwise properties would admit of existence in separation from substances if on the other hand unqualified not being means what is not in any sense at all it will be a universal negation of all forms of being so that what comes to be will have to come to be out of nothing although we have dealt with these problems at greater length in another work where we have set forth the difficulties and established the distinguishing definitions the following concise restatement of our results must here be offered in one sense things come to be out of that which has no being without qualification yet in another sense they come to be always out of what is for coming to be necessarily implies the pre-existence of something which potentially is but actually is not and this something is spoken of both as being and as not being these distinctions may be taken as established but even then it is extraordinarily difficult to see how there can be unqualified coming to be whether we suppose it to occur out of what potentially is or in some other way and we must recall this problem for further examination for the question might be raised whether substance i e the this comes to be at all is it not rather the such the so great or the somewhere which comes to be and the same question might be raised about passing away also for if a substantial thing comes to be it is clear that there will be not actually but potentially a substance out of which its coming to be will proceed and into which the thing that is passing away will necessarily change then will any predicate belonging to the remaining categories attach actually to this presupposed substance in other words will that which is only potentially a this which only potentially is while without the qualification potentially it is not a this i e is not possess e g any determinate size or quality or position for one if it possesses none of these determinations actually but all of them only potentially the result is first that a being which is not a determinate being is capable of separate existence and in addition that coming to be proceeds out of nothing pre-existing a thesis which more than any other preoccupied and alarmed the earliest philosophers on the other hand too if although it is not a this somewhat or a substance it is to possess some of the remaining determinations quoted above then as we said properties will be separable from substances we must therefore concentrate all our powers on the discussion of these difficulties and on the solution of a further question viz what is the cause of the perpetuity of coming to be why is there always unqualified as well as partial coming to be cause in this connection has two senses it means one the source from which as we say the process originates and two the matter it is the material cause that we have here to state for as to the other cause we have already explained in our treatise on motion that it involves a something immovable through all time and b something always being moved and the accurate treatment of the first of these of the immovable originative source belongs to the province of the other or prior philosophy while as regards that which sets everything else in motion by being itself continuously moved we shall have to explain later which amongst the so-called specific causes exhibits this character but at present we are to state the material cause the cause classed under the head of matter to which it is due that passing away and coming to be never failed to occur in nature 
for perhaps if we succeed in clearing up this question it will simultaneously become clear what account we ought to give of that which perplexed us just now i e of unqualified passing away and coming to be our new question too viz what is the cause of the unbroken continuity of coming to be is sufficiently perplexing if in fact what passes away vanishes into what is not and what is not is nothing since what is not is neither a thing nor possessed of a quality or quantity nor in any place if then some one of the things which are is constantly disappearing why has not the whole of what is been used up long ago and vanished away assuming of course that the material of all the several comings to be was finite for presumably the unfailing continuity of coming to be cannot be attributed to the infinity of the material that is impossible for nothing is actually infinite a thing is infinite only potentially i e the dividing of it can continue indefinitely so that we should have to suppose there is only one kind of coming to be in the world viz one which never fails because it is such that what comes to be is on each successive occasion smaller than before but in fact this is not what we see occurring why then is this form of change necessarily ceaseless is it because the passing away of this is a coming to be of something else and the coming to be of this a passing away of something else the cause implied in this solution must no doubt be considered adequate to account for coming to be and passing away in their general character as they occur in all existing things alike yet if the same process is a coming to be of this but a passing away of that and a passing away of this but a coming to be of that why are some things said to come to be and pass away without qualification but others only with a qualification this distinction must be investigated once more for it demands some explanation it is applied in a twofold manner for one we say it is now passing away without qualification and not merely this is passing away and we call this change coming to be and that passing away without qualification and two so and so comes to be something but does not come to be without qualification for we say that the student comes to be learned not comes to be without qualification one now we often divide terms into those which signify a uh, this somewhat and those which do not and the first form of the distinction which we are investigating results from a similar division of terms for it makes a difference into what the changing thing changes perhaps e g the passage into fire is coming to be unqualified but passing away of something e g of earth whilst the coming to be of earth is qualified not unqualified coming to be though unqualified passing away e g of fire this would be the case on the theory set forth in parmenides for he says that the things into which change takes place are two and he asserts that these two viz what is and what is not are fire and earth whether we postulate these or other things of a similar kind makes no difference for we are trying to discover not what undergoes these changes but what is their characteristic manner the passage then into what is not except with a qualification is unqualified passing away while the passage into what is without qualification is unqualified coming to be hence whatever the contrasted poles of the changes may be 
whether fire and earth or some other couple the one of them will be a being and the other a not being we have thus stated one characteristic manner in which unqualified will be distinguished from qualified coming to be and passing away but they are also distinguished according to the special nature of the material of the changing thing for a material whose constitutive differences signify more a uh, this somewhat is itself more substantial or real while a material whose constitutive differences signify privation is not real suppose e g that the hot is a positive predication i e a form whereas cold is a privation and that earth and fire differ from one another by these constitutive differences the opinion however which most people are inclined to prefer is that the distinction depends upon the difference between the perceptible and the imperceptible thus when there is a change into perceptible material people say there is coming to be but when there is a change into invisible material they call it passing away for they distinguish what is and what is not by their perceiving and not perceiving just as what is knowable is and what is unknowable is not perception on their view having the force of knowledge hence just as they deem themselves to live and to be in virtue of their perceiving or their capacity to perceive so too they deem the things to be qua perceived or perceptible and in this they are in a sense on the track of the truth though what they actually say is not true thus unqualified coming to be and passing away turn out to be different according to common opinion from what they are in truth for wind and air are in truth more real more a this somewhat or a form than earth but they are less real to perception which explains why things are commonly said to pass away without qualification when they change into wind and air and to come to be when they change into what is tangible i e into earth we have now explained why there is unqualified coming to be though it is a passing away of something and unqualified passing away though it is a coming to be of something for this distinction of appellation depends upon a difference in the material out of which and into which the changes are affected it depends either upon whether the material is or is not substantial or upon whether it is more or less substantial or upon whether it is more or less perceptible two but why are some things said to come to be without qualification and others only to come to be so and so in cases different from the one we have been considering where two things come to be reciprocally out of one another for at present we have explained no more than this why when two things change reciprocally into one another we do not attribute coming to be and passing away uniformly to them both although every coming to be is a passing away of something else and every passing away some other things coming to be but the question subsequently formulated involves a different problem viz why although the learning thing is said to come to be learned but not to come to be without qualification yet the growing thing is said to come to be the distinction here turns upon the difference of the categories for some things signify a uh, this somewhat others a uh, such and others a uh, so much those things then which do not signify substance are not said to come to be without qualification but only to come to be so and so nevertheless in all changing things alike we speak of coming to be 
when the thing comes to be something in one of the two columns e g in substance if it comes to be fire but not if it comes to be earth and in quality if it comes to be learned but not when it comes to be ignorant we have explained why some things come to be without qualification but not others both in general and also when the changing things are substances and nothing else and we have stated that the substratum is the material cause of the continuous occurrence of coming to be because it is such as to change from contrary to contrary and because in substances the coming to be of one thing is always a passing away of another and the passing away of one thing is always another's coming to be but there is no need even to discuss the other question we raised viz why coming to be continues though things are constantly being destroyed for just as people speak of a passing away without qualification when a thing has passed into what is imperceptible and what in that sense is not so also they speak of a coming to be out of a not being when a thing emerges from an imperceptible whether therefore the substratum is or is not something what comes to be emerges out of a not being so that a thing comes to be out of a not being just as much as it passes away into what is not hence it is reasonable enough that coming to be should never fail for coming to be is a passing away of what is not and passing away is a coming to be of what is not but what about that which is not except with a qualification is it one of the two contrary poles of the change e g is earth i e the heavy a not being but fire i e the light a being or on the contrary does what is include earth as well as fire whereas what is not is matter the matter of earth and fire alike and again is the matter of each different or is it the same since otherwise they would not come to be reciprocally out of one another i e contraries out of contraries for these things fire earth water air are characterized by the contraries perhaps the solution is that their matter is in one sense the same but in another sense different for that which underlies them whatever its nature may be qua underlying them is the same but its actual being is not the same so much then on these topics chapter four next we must state what the difference is between coming to be and alteration for we maintain that these changes are distinct from one another since then we must distinguish a the substratum and b the property whose nature it is to be predicated of the substratum and since change of each of these occurs there is alteration when the substratum is perceptible and persists but changes in its own properties the properties in question being opposed to one another either as contraries or as intermediates the body e g although persisting as the same body is now healthy and now ill and the bronze is now spherical and at another time angular and yet remains the same bronze but when nothing perceptible persists in its identity as a substratum and the thing changes as a whole when e g the seed as a whole is converted into blood or water into air or air as a whole into water such an occurrence is no longer alteration it is a coming to be of one substance and a passing away of the other especially if the change proceeds from an imperceptible something to something perceptible either to touch or to all the senses as when water comes to be out of or passes away into air 
for air is pretty well imperceptible if however in such cases any property being one of a pair of contraries persists in the thing that has come to be the same as it was in the thing which has passed away if e g when water comes to be out of air both are transparent or cold the second thing into which the first changes must not be a property of this persistent identical something otherwise the change will be alteration suppose e g that the musical man passed away and an unmusical man came to be and that the man persists as something identical now if musicalness and unmusicalness had not been a property essentially inhering in man these changes would have been a coming to be of unmusicalness and a passing away of musicalness but in fact musicalness and unmusicalness are a property of the persistent identity viz man hence as regards man these changes are modifications though as regards musical man and unmusical man they are a passing away and a coming to be consequently such changes are alteration when the change from contrary to contrary is in quantity it is growth and diminution when it is in place it is motion when it is in property i e in quality it is alteration but when nothing persists of which the resultant is a property or an accident in any sense of the term it is coming to be and the converse change is passing away matter in the most proper sense of the term is to be identified with the substratum which is receptive of coming to be and passing away but the substratum of the remaining kinds of change is also in a certain sense matter because all these substrata are receptive of contrarieties of some kind so much then as an answer to the questions one whether coming to be is or is not i e what are the precise conditions of its occurrence and two what alteration is but we have still to treat of growth End of chapter 4 Recording in memory of Mitchell Edwards Chapters 5 and 6 of Book 1 of On Generation and Corruption by Aristotle Translated by Harold Joachim This LibriVox recording is in the public domain recording by geoffrey edwards chapter five we must explain one wherein growth differs from coming to be and from alteration and two what is the process of growing and the process of diminishing in each and all of the things that grow and diminish hence our first question is this do these changes differ from one another solely because of a difference in their respective spheres in other words do they differ because while a change from this to that viz from potential to actual substance is coming to be a change in the sphere of magnitude is growth and one in the sphere of quality is alteration both growth and alteration being changes from what is potentially to what is actually magnitude and quality respectively or is there also a difference in the manner of the change since it is evident that whereas neither what is altering nor what is coming to be necessarily changes its place what is growing or diminishing changes its spatial position of necessity though in a different manner from that in which the moving thing does so for that which is being moved changes its place as a whole but the growing thing changes its place like a metal that is being beaten retaining its position as a whole 
while its parts change their places they change their places but not in the same way as the parts of a revolving globe for the parts of the globe change their places while the whole continues to occupy an equal place but the parts of the growing thing expand over an ever-increasing place and the parts of the diminishing thing contract within an ever-diminishing area it is clear then that these changes the changes of that which is coming to be of that which is altering and of that which is growing differ in manner as well as in sphere but how are we to conceive the sphere of the change which is growth and diminution the sphere of growing and diminishing is believed to be magnitude are we to suppose that body and magnitude come to be out of something which though potentially magnitude and body is actually incorporeal and devoid of magnitude and since this description may be understood in two different ways in which of these two ways are we to apply it to the process of growth is the matter out of which growth takes place one separate and existing alone by itself or two separate but contained in another body perhaps it is impossible for growth to take place in either of these ways for since the matter is separate either a it will occupy no place as if it were a point or b it will be a void i e a non-perceptible body but the first of these alternatives is impossible for since what comes to be out of this incorporeal and sizeless something will always be somewhere it too must be somewhere either intrinsically or indirectly and the second alternative necessarily implies that the matter is contained in some other body but if it is to be in another body and yet remain separate in such a way that it is in no sense a part of that body neither a part of its substantial being nor an accident of it many impossibilities will result it is as if we were to suppose that when e g air comes to be out of water the process were due not to a change of the water but to the matter of the air being contained in the water as in a vessel this is impossible for one there is nothing to prevent an indeterminate number of matters being thus contained in the water so that they might come to be actually an indeterminate quantity of air and two we do not in fact see air coming to be out of water in this fashion viz withdrawing out of it and leaving it unchanged it is therefore better to suppose that in all instances of coming to be the matter is inseparable being numerically identical and one with the containing body though isolable from it by definition but the same reasons also forbid us to regard the matter out of which the body comes to be as points or lines the matter is that of which points and lines are limits and it is something that can never exist without quality and without form now it is no doubt true as we have also established elsewhere that one thing comes to be in the unqualified sense out of another thing and further it is true that the efficient cause of its coming to be is either one an actual thing which is the same as the effect either generically for the efficient cause of the coming to be of a hard thing is not a hard thing or specifically as e g fire is the efficient cause of the coming to be of fire or one man of the birth of another or two an actuality nevertheless since there is also a matter out of which corporeal substance itself comes to be corporeal substance however already characterized as such and such a determinate body for there is no such thing as body in general this same matter is also the matter of magnitude and quality being separable from these matters by definition but not separable in place unless qualities are in their turn separable 
it is evident from the preceding development and discussion of difficulties that growth is not a change out of something which though potentially a magnitude actually possesses no magnitude for if it were the void would exist in separation but we have explained in a former work that this is impossible moreover a change of that kind is not peculiarly distinctive of growth but characterizes coming to be as such or in general for growth is an increase and diminution is a lessening of the magnitude which is there already that indeed is why the growing thing must possess some magnitude hence growth must not be regarded as a process from a matter without magnitude to an actuality of magnitude for this would be a body's coming to be rather than its growth we must therefore come to closer quarters with the subject of our inquiry we must grapple with it as it were from its beginning and determine the precise character of the growing and diminishing whose causes we are investigating it is evident one that any and every part of the growing thing has increased and that similarly in diminution every part has become smaller also two that a thing grows by the accession and diminishes by the departure of something hence it must grow by the accession either a of something incorporeal or b of a body now if a it grows by the accession of something incorporeal there will exist separate a void but as we have stated before it is impossible for a matter of magnitude to exist separate if on the other hand b it grows by the accession of a body there will be two bodies that which grows and that which increases it in the same place and this too is impossible but neither is it open to us to say that growth or diminution occurs in the way in which e g air is generated from water for although the volume has then become greater the change will not be growth but a coming to be of the one viz of that into which the change is taking place and a passing away of the contrasted body it is not a growth of either nothing grows in the process unless indeed there be something common to both things to that which is coming to be and to that which passed away e g body and this grows the water has not grown nor has the air but the former has passed away and the latter has come to be and if anything has grown there has been a growth of body yet this too is impossible for our account of growth must preserve the characteristics of that which is growing and diminishing and these characteristics are three one any and every part of the growing magnitude is made bigger e g if flesh grows every particle of the flesh gets bigger two by the accession of something and three in such a way that the growing thing is preserved and persists for whereas a thing does not persist in the process of unqualified coming to be or passing away that which grows or alters persists in its identity through the altering and through the growing or diminishing though the quality in alteration and the size in growth do not remain the same now if the generation of air from water is to be regarded as growth a thing might grow without the accession and without the persistence of anything and diminish without the departure of anything and that which grows need not persist but this characteristic must be preserved for the growth we are discussing has been assumed to be thus characterized one might raise a further difficulty what is that which grows is it that to which something is added if e g a man grows in his shin is it the shin which is greater but not that whereby he grows viz not the food then why have not both grown for 
when a is added to b both a and b are greater as when you mix wine with water for each ingredient is alike increased in volume perhaps the explanation is that the substance of the one remains unchanged but the substance of the other viz of the food does not for indeed even in the mixture of wine and water it is the prevailing ingredient which is said to have increased in volume we say e g that the wine has increased because the whole mixture acts as wine but not as water a similar principle applies also to alteration flesh is said to have been altered if while its character and substance remain some one of its essential properties which was not there before now qualifies it on the other hand that whereby it has been altered may have undergone no change though sometimes it too has been affected the altering agent however and the originative source of the process are in the growing thing and in that which is being altered for the efficient cause is in these no doubt the food which has come in may sometimes expand as well as the body that has consumed it that is so e g if after having come in a food is converted into wind but when it has undergone this change it has passed away and the efficient cause is not in the food we have now developed the difficulties sufficiently and must therefore try to find a solution of the problem our solution must preserve intact the three characteristics of growth that the growing thing persists that it grows by the accession and diminishes by the departure of something and further that every perceptible particle of it has become either larger or smaller we must recognize also a that the growing body is not void and that yet there are not two magnitudes in the same place and b that it does not grow by the accession of something incorporeal two preliminary distinctions will prepare us to grasp the cause of growth we must note one that the organic parts grow by the growth of the tissues for every organ is composed of these as its constituents and two that flesh bone and every such part like every other thing which has its form immersed in matter has a twofold nature for the form as well as the matter is called flesh or bone now that any and every part of the tissue qua form should grow and grow by the accession of something is possible but not that any and every part of the tissue qua matter should do so for we must think of the tissue after the image of flowing water that is measured by one and the same measure particle after particle comes to be and each successive particle is different and it is in this sense that the matter of the flesh grows some flowing out and some flowing in fresh not in the sense that fresh matter exceeds to every particle of it there is however an accession to every part of its figure or form that growth has taken place proportionally is more manifest in the organic parts e g in the hand for there the fact that the matter is distinct from the form is more manifest than in flesh i e than in the tissues that is why there is a greater tendency to suppose that a corpse still possesses flesh and bone than that it still has a hand or an arm hence in one sense it is true that any and every part of the flesh has grown but in another sense it is false for there has been an accession to every part of the flesh in respect to its form but not in respect to its matter the whole however has become larger and this increase is due a on the one hand to the accession of something which is called food and is said to be contrary to flesh but b on the other hand to the transformation of this food into the same form as that of flesh as if e g moist were to exceed to dry and having exceeded were to be transformed and to become dry for in one sense like grows by like 
but in another sense unlike grows by unlike one might discuss what must be the character of that whereby a thing grows clearly it must be potentially that which is growing potentially flesh e g if it is flesh that is growing actually therefore it must be other than the growing thing this actual other then has passed away and come to be flesh but it has not been transformed into flesh alone by itself for that would have been a coming to be not a growth on the contrary it is the growing thing which has come to be flesh and grown by the food in what way then has the food been modified by the growing thing perhaps we should say that it has been mixed with it as if one were to pour water into wine and the wine were able to convert the new ingredient into wine and as fire lays hold of the inflammable so the active principle of growth dwelling in the growing thing i e in that which is actually flesh lays hold of an exceeding food which is potentially flesh and converts it into actual flesh the exceeding food therefore must be together with the growing thing for if it were apart from it the change would be a coming to be for it is possible to produce fire by piling logs on to the already burning fire that is growth but when the logs themselves are set on fire that is coming to be quantum in general does not come to be any more than animal which is neither man nor any other of the specific forms of animal what animal in general is in coming to be that quantum in general is in growth but what does come to be in growth is flesh or bone or a hand or arm i e the tissues of these organic parts such things come to be then by the accession not of quantified flesh but of a quantified something in so far as this exceeding food is potentially the double result e g is potentially so much flesh it produces growth for it is bound to become actually both so much and flesh but in so far as it is potentially flesh only it nourishes for it is thus that nutrition and growth differ by their definition that is why a body's nutrition continues so long as it is kept alive even when it is diminishing though not its growth and why nutrition though the same as growth is yet different from it in its actual being for in so far as that which exceeds is potentially so much flesh it tends to increase flesh whereas in so far as it is potentially flesh only it is nourishment the form of which we have spoken is a kind of power immersed in matter a duct as it were if then a matter exceeds a matter which is potentially a duct and also potentially possesses determinate quantity the ducts to which it exceeds will become bigger but if it is no longer able to act if it has been weakened by the continued influx of matter just as water continually mixed in greater and greater quantity with wine in the end makes the wine watery and converts it into water then it will cause a diminution of the quantum though still the form persists chapter six in discussing the causes of coming to be we must first investigate the matter i e the so-called elements we must ask whether they really are elements or not i e whether each of them is eternal or whether there is a sense in which they come to be and if they do come to be whether all of them come to be in the same manner reciprocally out of one another or whether one amongst them is something primary hence we must begin by explaining certain preliminary matters about which the statements now current are vague for all the pluralist philosophers those who generate the elements as well as those who generate the bodies that are compounded of the elements make use of dissociation and association and of action and passion now association is combination 
but the precise meaning of the process we call combining has not been explained again all the monists make use of alteration but without an agent and a patient there cannot be altering any more than there can be dissociating and associating for not only those who postulate a plurality of elements employ their reciprocal action and passion to generate the compounds those who derive things from a single element are equally compelled to introduce acting and in this respect diogenes is right when he argues that unless all things were derived from one reciprocal action and passion could not have occurred the hot thing e g would not be cooled and the cold thing in turn be warmed for heat and cold do not change reciprocally into one another but what changes it is clear is the substratum hence whenever there is action and passion between two things that which underlies them must be a single something no doubt it is not true to say that all things are of this character but it is true of all things between which there is reciprocal action and passion but if we must investigate action passion and combination we must also investigate contact for action and passion in the proper sense of the terms can only occur between things which are such as to touch one another nor can things enter into combination at all unless they have come into a certain kind of contact hence we must give a definite account of these three things of contact combination and acting let us start as follows all things which admit of combination must be capable of reciprocal contact and the same is true of any two things of which one acts and the other suffers action in the proper sense of the terms for this reason we must treat of contact first now every term which possesses a variety of meanings includes those various meanings either owing to a mere coincidence of language or owing to a real order of derivation in the different things to which it is applied but though this may be taken to hold of contact as of all such terms it is nevertheless true that contact in the proper sense applies only to things which have position and position belongs only to those things which also have a place for in so far as we attribute contact to the mathematical things we must also attribute place to them whether they exist in separation or in some other fashion assuming therefore that to touch is as we have defined it in a previous work to have the extremes together only those things will touch one another which being separate magnitudes and possessing position have their extremes together and since position belongs only to those things which also have a place while the primary differentiation of place is the above and the below and the similar pairs of opposites all things which touch one another will have weight or lightness either both these qualities or one or the other of them but bodies which are heavy or light are such as to act and suffer action hence it is clear that those things are by nature such as to touch one another which being separate magnitudes have their extremes together and are able to move and be moved by one another the manner in which the mover moves the moved is not always the same on the contrary whereas one kind of mover can only impart motion by being itself moved another kind can do so though remaining itself unmoved clearly therefore we must recognize a corresponding variety in speaking of the acting thing too for the mover is said to act in a sense and the acting thing to impart motion nevertheless there is a difference and we must draw a distinction for not every mover can act if a the term agent is to be used in contrast to patient and b patient is to be applied only to those things whose motion is a qualitative affection i e a quality 
like white or hot in respect to which they are moved only in the sense that they are altered on the contrary to impart motion is a wider term than to act still so much at any rate is clear the things which are such as to impart motion if that description be interpreted in one sense will touch the things which are such as to be moved by them while they will not touch them if the description be interpreted in a different sense but the disjunctive definition of touching must include and distinguish a contact in general as the relation between two things which having position are such that one is able to impart motion and the other to be moved and b reciprocal contact as the relation between two things one able to impart motion and the other able to be moved in such a way that action and passion are predicable of them as a rule no doubt if a touches b b touches a for indeed practically all the movers within our ordinary experience impart motion by being moved in their case what touches inevitably must and also evidently does touch something which reciprocally touches it yet if a moves b it is possible as we sometimes express it for a merely to touch b and that which touches need not touch a something which touches it nevertheless it is commonly supposed that touching must be reciprocal the reason of this belief is that movers which belong to the same kind as the moved impart motion by being moved hence if anything imparts motion without itself being moved it may touch the moved and yet itself be touched by nothing for we say sometimes that the man who grieves us touches us but not that we touch him the account just given may serve to distinguish and define the contact which occurs in the things of nature end of chapter six recording in memory of mitchell edwards chapter seven and eight of book one of on generation and corruption by aristotle translated by harold joachim this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by geoffrey edwards chapter seven next in order we must discuss action and passion the traditional theories on the subject are conflicting for one most thinkers are unanimous in maintaining a that like is always unaffected by like because as they argue neither of two likes is more apt than the other either to act or to suffer action since all the properties which belong to the one belong identically and in the same degree to the other and b that unlikes i e difference are by nature such as to act and suffer action reciprocally for even when the smaller fire is destroyed by the greater it suffers this effect they say owing to its contrariety since the great is contrary to the small but two democritus dissented from all the other thinkers and maintained a theory peculiar to himself he asserts that agent and patient are identical i e like it is not possible he says that others i e difference should suffer action from one another on the contrary even if two things being others do act in some way on one another this happens to them not qua others but qua possessing an identical property such then are the traditional theories and it looks as if the statements of their advocates were in manifest conflict but the reason of this conflict is that each group is in fact stating a part whereas they ought to have taken a comprehensive view of the subject as a whole for one if a and b are like 
absolutely and in all respects without difference from one another it is reasonable to infer that neither is in any way affected by the other why indeed should either of them tend to act any more than the other moreover if like can be affected by like a thing can also be affected by itself and yet if that were so if like tended in fact to act qua like there would be nothing indestructible or immovable for everything would move itself and two the same consequence follows if a and b are absolutely other i e in no respect identical whiteness could not be affected in any way by line nor line by whiteness except perhaps coincidentally viz if the line happened to be white or black for unless two things either are or are composed of contraries neither drives the other out of its natural condition but three since only those things which either involve a contrariety or are contraries and not any things selected at random are such as to suffer action and to act agent and patient must be like i e identical in kind and yet unlike i e contrary in species for it is a law of nature that body is affected by body flavour by flavour colour by colour and so in general what belongs to any kind by a member of the same kind the reason being that contraries are in every case within a single identical kind and it is contraries which reciprocally act and suffer action hence agent and patient must be in one sense identical but in another sense other than i e unlike one another and since a patient and agent are generically identical i e like but specifically unlike while b it is contraries that exhibit this character it is clear that contraries and their intermediates are such as to suffer action and to act reciprocally for indeed it is these that constitute the entire sphere of passing away and coming to be we can now understand why fire heats and the cold thing cools and in general why the active thing assimilates to itself the patient for agent and patient are contrary to one another and coming to be is a process into the contrary hence the patient must change into the agent since it is only thus that coming to be will be a process into the contrary and again it is intelligible that the advocates of both views although their theories are not the same are yet in contact with the nature of the facts for sometimes we speak of the substratum as suffering action e g of the man as being healed being warmed and chilled and similarly in all the other cases but at other times we say what is cold is being warmed what is sick is being healed and in both these ways of speaking we express the truth since in one sense it is the matter while in another sense it is the contrary which suffers action we make the same distinction in speaking of the agent for sometimes we say that the man but at other times that what is hot produces heat now the one group of thinkers supposed that agent and patient must possess something identical because they fastened their attention on the substratum while the other group maintained the opposite because their attention was concentrated on the contraries we must conceive the same account to hold of action and passion as that which is true of being moved and imparting motion for the mover like the agent has two meanings both a that which contains the originative source of the motion is thought to impart motion for the originative source is first amongst the causes and also b that which is last 
i e immediately next to the moved thing and to the coming to be a similar distinction holds also of the agent for we speak not only a of the doctor but also b of the wine as healing now in motion there is nothing to prevent the first mover being unmoved indeed as regards some first movers this is actually necessary although the last mover always imparts motion by being itself moved and in action there is nothing to prevent the first agent being unaffected while the last agent only acts by suffering action itself for a if agent and patient have not the same matter agent acts without being affected thus the art of healing produces health without itself being acted upon in any way by that which is being healed but b the food in acting is itself in some way acted upon for in acting it is simultaneously heated or cooled or otherwise affected now the art of healing corresponds to an originative source while the food corresponds to the last i e contiguous mover those active powers then whose forms are not embodied in matter are unaffected but those whose forms are in matter are such as to be affected in acting for we maintain that one and the same matter is equally so to say the basis of either of the two opposed things being as it were a kind and that that which can be hot must be made hot provided the heating agent is there i e comes near hence as we have said some of the active powers are unaffected while others are such as to be affected and what holds of motion is true also of the active powers for as in motion the first mover is unmoved so among the active powers the first agent is unaffected the active power is a cause in the sense of that from which the process originates but the end for the sake of which it takes place is not active that is why health is not active except metaphorically for when the agent is there the patient becomes something but when states are there the patient no longer becomes but already is and forms i e ends are a kind of state as to the matter it qua matter is passive now fire contains the hot embodied in matter but a hot separate from matter if such a thing existed could not suffer any action perhaps indeed it is impossible that the hot should exist in separation from matter but if there are any entities thus separable what we are saying would be true of them we have thus explained what action and passion are what things exhibit them why they do so and in what manner chapter eight we must go on to discuss how it is possible for action and passion to take place some philosophers think that the last agent the agent in the strictest sense enters in through certain pores and so the patient suffers action it is in this way they assert that we see and hear and exercise all our other senses moreover according to them things are seen through air and water and other transparent bodies because such bodies possess pores invisible indeed owing to their minuteness but close-set and arranged in rows and the more transparent the body the more frequent and serial they suppose its pores to be such was the theory which some philosophers including empedocles advanced in regard to the structure of certain bodies they do not restrict it to the bodies which act and suffer action but combination too they say takes place only between bodies whose pores are in reciprocal symmetry the most systematic and consistent theory however and 
one that applied to all bodies was advanced by leucippus and democritus and in maintaining it they took as their starting point what naturally comes first for some of the older philosophers thought that what is must of necessity be one and immovable the void they argue is not but unless there is a void with a separate being of its own what is cannot be moved nor again can it be many since there is nothing to keep things apart and in this respect they insist the view that the universe is not continuous but discretes in contact is no better than the view that there are many and not one and a void for suppose that the universe is discretes in contact then if it is divisible through and through there is no one and therefore no many either but the whole is void while to maintain that it is divisible at some points but not at others looks like an arbitrary fiction for up to what limit is it divisible and for what reason is part of the whole indivisible i e a plenum and part divided further they maintain it is equally necessary to deny the existence of motion reasoning in this way therefore they were led to transcend sense perception and to disregard it on the ground that one ought to follow the argument and so they assert that the universe is one and immovable some of them add that it is infinite since the limit if it had one would be a limit against the void there were then certain thinkers who for the reasons we have stated enunciated views of this kind as their theory of the truth moreover although these opinions appear to follow logically in a dialectical discussion yet to believe them seems next door to madness when one considers the facts for indeed no lunatic seems to be so far out of his senses as to suppose that fire and ice are one it is only between what is right and what seems right from habit that some people are mad enough to see no difference leucippus however thought he had a theory which harmonized with sense perception and would not abolish either coming to be and passing away or motion and the multiplicity of things he made these concessions to the facts of perception on the other hand he conceded to the monists that there could be no motion without a void the result is a theory which he states as follows Quote, the void is a not being and no part of what is is a not being for what is in the strict sense of the term is an absolute plenum this plenum however is not one on the contrary it is a many infinite in number and invisible owing to the minuteness of their bulk the many move in the void for there is a void and by coming together they produce coming to be while by separating they produce passing away moreover they act and suffer action wherever they chance to be in contact for there they are not one and they generate by being put together and becoming intertwined from the genuinely one on the other hand there never could have come to be a multiplicity nor from the genuinely many a one that is impossible but just as empedocles and some of the other philosophers say that things suffer action through their pores so all alteration and all passion take place in the way that has been explained breaking up i e passing away is effected by means of the void and so too is growth solids creeping in to fill the void places empedocles too is practically bound to adopt the same theory as leucippus for he must say that there are certain solids which however are indivisible 
unless there are continuous pores all through the body but this last alternative is impossible for then there will be nothing solid in the body nothing beside the pores but all of it will be void it is necessary therefore for his contiguous discretes to be indivisible while the intervals between them which he calls pores must be void but this is precisely leucippus's theory of action and passion such approximately are the current explanations of the manner in which some things act while others suffer action and as regards the atomists it is not only clear what their explanation is it is also obvious that it follows with tolerable consistency from the assumptions they employ but there is less obvious consistency in the explanation offered by the other thinkers it is not clear for instance how on the theory of empedocles there is to be passing away as well as alteration for the primary bodies of the atomists the primary constituents of which bodies are composed and the ultimate elements into which they are dissolved are indivisible differing from one another only in figure in the philosophy of empedocles on the other hand it is evident that all the other bodies down to the elements have their coming to be and their passing away but it is not clear how the elements themselves severally in their aggregated masses come to be and pass away nor is it possible for empedocles to explain how they do so since he does not assert that fire too and similarly every one of his other elements possesses elementary constituents of itself such an assertion would commit him to doctrines like those which plato has set forth in the timaeus for although both plato and leucippus postulate elementary constituents that are indivisible and distinctively characterized by figures there is this great difference between the two theories the indivisibles of leucippus one are solids while those of plato are planes and two are characterized by an infinite variety of figures while the characterizing figures employed by plato are limited in number thus the comings to be and the dissociations result from the indivisibles a according to leucippus through the void and through contact for it is at the point of contact that each of the composite bodies is divisible but b according to plato in virtue of contact alone since he denies there is a void now we have discussed indivisible planes in the preceding treatise but with regard to the assumption of indivisible solids although we must not now enter upon a detailed study of its consequences the following criticisms fall within the compass of a short digression one the atomists are committed to the view that every indivisible is incapable alike of receiving a sensible property for nothing can suffer action except through the void and of producing one no indivisible can be e g either hard or cold yet it is surely a paradox that an exception is made of the hot the hot being assigned as peculiar to the spherical figure for that being so its contrary also the cold is bound to belong to another of the figures if however these properties heat and cold do belong to the indivisibles it is a further paradox that they should not possess heaviness and lightness and hardness and softness and yet democritus says the more any indivisible exceeds the heavier it is to which we must clearly add and the hotter it is but if that is their character it is impossible they should not be affected by one another the slightly hot indivisible e g will inevitably suffer action from one which far exceeds it in heat again if any indivisible is hard there must also be one which is soft 
but the soft derives its very name from the fact that it suffers a certain action for soft is that which yields to pressure two but further not only is it paradoxical one that no property except figure should belong to the indivisibles it is also paradoxical two that if other properties do belong to them one only of these additional properties should attach to each e g that this indivisible should be cold and that indivisible hot for on that supposition their substance would not even be uniform and it is equally impossible three that more than one of these additional properties should belong to the single indivisible for being indivisible it will possess these properties in the same point so that if it suffers action by being chilled it will also qua chilled act or suffer action in some other way and the same line of argument applies to all the other properties too for the difficulty we have just raised confronts as a necessary consequence all who advocate indivisibles whether solids or planes since their indivisibles cannot become either rarer or denser inasmuch as there is no void in them three it is a further paradox that there should be small indivisibles but not large ones for it is natural enough from the ordinary point of view that the larger bodies should be more liable to fracture than the small ones since they viz the large bodies are easily broken up because they collide with many other bodies but why should indivisibility as such be the property of small rather than of large bodies for again is the substance of all those solids uniform or do they fall into sets which differ from one another as if e g some of them in their aggregated bulk were fiery others earthy for one if all of them are uniform in substance what is it that separated one from another or why when they come into contact do they not coalesce into one as drops of water run together when drop touches drop for the two cases are precisely parallel on the other hand too if they fall into differing sets how are these characterized it is clear too that these rather than the figures ought to be postulated as original reals i e causes from which the phenomena result moreover if they differed in substance they would both act and suffer action on coming into reciprocal contact five again what is it which sets them moving for if their mover is other than themselves they are such as to suffer action if on the other hand each of them sets itself in motion either a it will be divisible imparting motion qua this being moved qua that or b contrary properties will attach to it in the same respect i e matter will be identical in potentiality as well as numerically identical as to the thinkers who explain modification of property through the movement facilitated by the pores if this is supposed to occur notwithstanding the fact that the pores are filled their postulate of pores is superfluous for if the whole body suffers action under these conditions it would suffer action in the same way even if it had no pores but were just its own continuous self moreover how can their account of vision through a medium be correct it is impossible for the visual ray to penetrate the transparent bodies at their contacts and impossible for it to pass through their pores if every pore be full for how will that differ from having no pores at all the body will be uniformly full throughout but further even if these passages though they must contain bodies are void the same consequence will follow once more and if they are too minute to admit any body 
it is absurd to suppose there is a minute void and yet to deny the existence of a big one no matter how small the big may be or to imagine the void means anything else than a body's place whence it clearly follows that to every body there will correspond a void of equal cubic capacity as a general criticism we must urge that to postulate pores is superfluous for if the agent produces no effect by touching the patient neither will it produce any by passing through its pores on the other hand if it acts by contact then even without pores some things will suffer action and others will act provided they are by nature adapted for reciprocal action and passion our arguments have shown that it is either false or futile to advocate pores in the sense in which some thinkers conceive them but since bodies are divisible through and through the postulate of pores is ridiculous for qua divisible a body can fall into separate parts end of chapter eight recording in memory of mitchell edwards chapters nine and ten of book one of on generation and corruption by aristotle translated by harold joachim this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by geoffrey edwards chapter nine let us explain the way in which things in fact possess the power of generating and of acting and suffering action and let us start from the principle we have often enunciated for assuming the distinction between a that which is potentially and b that which is actually such and such it is the nature of the first precisely in so far as it is what it is to suffer action through and through not merely to be susceptible in some parts while insusceptible in others but its susceptibility varies in degree according as it is more or less such and such and one would be more justified in speaking of pores in this connection for instance in the metals there are veins of the susceptible stretching continuously through the substance so long indeed as any body is naturally coherent and one it is insusceptible so too bodies are insusceptible so long as they are not in contact either with one another or with other bodies which are by nature such as to act and suffer action to illustrate my meaning fire heats not only when in contact but also from a distance for the fire heats the air and the air being by nature such as both to act and suffer action heats the body but the supposition that a body is susceptible in some parts but insusceptible in others is only possible for those who hold an erroneous view concerning the divisibility of magnitudes for us the following account results from the distinctions we established at the beginning for one if magnitudes are not divisible through and through if on the contrary there are indivisible solids or planes then indeed no body would be susceptible through and through but neither would any be continuous since however too this is false i e since every body is divisible there is no difference between having been divided into parts which remain in contact and being divisible for if a body can be separated at the contacts as some thinkers express it then even though it has not yet been divided it will be in a state of dividedness since as it can be divided nothing inconceivable results and three the supposition is open to this general objection it is a paradox that passion should occur in this manner only viz by the bodies being split for this theory abolishes alteration 
but we see the same body liquid at one time and solid at another without losing its continuity it has suffered this change not by division and composition nor yet by turning and intercontact as democritus asserts for it has passed from the liquid to the solid state without any change of grouping or position in the constituents of its substance nor are there contained within it those hard i e congealed particles indivisible in their bulk on the contrary it is liquid and again solid and congealed uniformly all through this theory it must be added makes growth and diminution impossible also for if there is to be apposition instead of the growing thing having changed as a whole either by the admixture of something or by its own transformation increase of size will not have resulted in any and every part so much then to establish that things generate and are generated act and suffer action reciprocally and to distinguish the way in which these processes can occur from the impossible way in which some thinkers say they occur chapter ten but we have still to explain combination for that was the third of the subjects we originally proposed to discuss our explanation will proceed on the same method as before we must inquire what is combination and what is that which can combine of what things and under what conditions is combination a property and further does combination exist in fact or is it false to assert its existence for according to some thinkers it is impossible for one thing to be combined with another they argue that one if both the combined constituents persist unaltered they are no more combined now than they were before but are in the same condition while two if one has been destroyed the constituents have not been combined on the contrary one constituent is and the other is not whereas combination demands uniformity of condition in them both and on the same principle three even if both the combining constituents have been destroyed as the result of their coalescence they cannot have been combined since they have no being at all what we have in this argument is it would seem a demand for the precise distinction of combination from coming to be and passing away for it is obvious that combination if it exists must differ from these processes and for the precise distinction of the combinable from that which is such as to come to be and pass away as soon therefore as these distinctions are clear the difficulties raised by the argument would be solved now one we do not speak of the wood as combined with the fire nor of its burning as a combining either of its particles with one another or of itself with the fire what we say is that the fire is coming to be but the wood is passing away similarly we speak neither too of the food as combining with the body nor three of the shape as combining with the wax and thus fashioning the lump nor can body combine with white nor to generalize properties and states with things for we see them persisting unaltered but again for white and knowledge cannot be combined either nor any other of the adjectivals indeed this is a blemish in the theory of those who assert that once upon a time all things were together and combined for not everything can combine with everything on the contrary both of the constituents that are combined in the compound must originally have existed in separation but no property can have separate existence since however some things are potentially while others are actually the constituents combined in a compound can be in a sense and yet not be the compound may be actually 
other than the constituents from which it has resulted nevertheless each of them may still be potentially what it was before they were combined and both of them may survive undestroyed for this was the difficulty that emerged in the previous argument and it is evident that the combining constituents not only coalesce having formerly existed in separation but also can again be separated out from the compound the constituents therefore neither a persist actually as body and white persist nor b are they destroyed either one of them or both for their power of action is preserved hence these difficulties may be dismissed but the problem immediately connected with them whether combination is something relative to perception must be set out and discussed when the combining constituents have been divided into parts so small and have been juxtaposed in such a manner that perception fails to discriminate them one from another have they then been combined or ought we to say no not until any and every part of one constituent is juxtaposed to a part of the other the term no doubt is applied in the former sense we speak e g of wheat having been combined with barley when each grain of the one is juxtaposed to a grain of the other but every body is divisible and therefore since body combined with body is uniform in texture throughout any and every part of each constituent ought to be juxtaposed to a part of the other no body however can be divided into its least parts and composition is not identical with combination but other than it from these premises it clearly follows one that so long as the constituents are preserved in small particles we must not speak of them as combined for this will be a composition instead of a blending or combination nor will every portion of the resultant exhibit the same ratio between its constituents as the whole but we maintain that if combination has taken place the compound must be uniform in texture throughout any part of such a compound being the same as the whole just as any part of water is water whereas if combination is composition of the small particles nothing of the kind will happen on the contrary the constituents will only be combined relatively to perception and the same thing will be combined to one percipient if his sight is not sharp but not to another while to the eye of lynceus nothing will be combined it clearly follows too that we must not speak of the constituents as combined in virtue of a division such that any and every part of each is juxtaposed to a part of the other for it is impossible for them to be thus divided either then there is no combination or we have still to explain the manner in which it can take place now as we maintain some things are such as to act and others such as to suffer action from them moreover some things viz those which have the same matter reciprocate i e are such as to act upon one another and to suffer action from one another while other things viz agents which have not the same matter as their patients act without themselves suffering action such agents cannot combine that is why neither the art of healing nor health produces health by combining with the bodies of the patients amongst those things however which are reciprocally active and passive some are easily divisible now one if a great quantity or a large bulk of one of these easily divisible reciprocating materials be brought together with a little or with a small piece of another the effect produced is not combination but increase of the dominant for the other material is transformed into the dominant that is why a drop of wine does not combine with ten thousand gallons of water for its form is dissolved 
and it is changed so as to merge in the total volume of water on the other hand too when there is a certain equilibrium between their powers of action then each of them changes out of its own nature towards the dominant yet neither becomes the other but both become an intermediate with properties common to both thus it is clear that only those agents are combinable which involve a contrariety for these are such as to suffer action reciprocally and further they combine more freely if small pieces of each of them are juxtaposed for in that condition they change one another more easily and more quickly whereas this effect takes a long time when agent and patient are present in bulk hence amongst the divisible susceptible materials those whose shape is readily adaptable have a tendency to combine for they are easily divided into small particles since that is precisely what being readily adaptable in shape implies for instance liquids are the most combinable of all bodies because of all divisible materials the liquid is most readily adaptable in shape unless it be viscous viscous liquids it is true produce no effect except to increase the volume and bulk but when one of the constituents is alone susceptible or superlatively susceptible the other being susceptible in a very slight degree the compound resulting from their combination is either no greater in volume or only a little greater this is what happens when tin is combined with bronze for some things display a hesitating and ambiguous attitude towards one another showing a slight tendency to combine and also an inclination to behave as receptive matter and form respectively the behaviour of these metals is a case in point for the tin almost vanishes behaving as if it were an immaterial property of the bronze having been combined it disappears leaving no trace except the colour it has imparted to the bronze the same phenomenon occurs in other instances too it is clear then from the foregoing account that combination occurs what it is to what it is due and what kind of thing is combinable the phenomenon depends upon the fact that some things are such as to be a reciprocally susceptible and b readily adaptable in shape i e easily divisible for such things can be combined without its being necessary either that they should have been destroyed or that they should survive absolutely unaltered and their combination need not be a composition nor merely relative to perception on the contrary anything is combinable which being readily adaptable in shape is such as to suffer action and to act and it is combinable with another thing similarly characterized for the combinable is relative to the combinable and combination is unification of the combinables resulting from their alteration end of chapter ten and end of book one recording in memory of mitchell edwards